Pari Erego Sirele Harnagis Nerich, Pesame Shapati Rego Gimian and Guru Yeterov, I saw with Hosing, Meme Garevo, Meme was Garevo, Hartsim Massin, Miazian Nangeru Nerkin, Hartsim Massin, Kinek were Christmas a year go over Verche, Pats Kal Shapat with the Hosim Christmassy, Yev Nordarva, Vera Perial. I saw Ramer Hurishat Garevo and Snavoruchumane, Executive Intelligence Review, Yev Staff Rider of La Ruch. Shat Garevor and Snavoruchum, and they were Angler and Obi Pasadre, Inch Katarnagur, I saw Mer Ashari Shurche, Nerkin, Niazan Nangurun, Nerk Nersin. Ye will launch the Angler and O programmer, or Garevor or Urish Nerunamadigan. So Iranune Dennis Speed, well, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna take any longer. I'm gonna, I introduced you in Armenian, and now I'm gonna introduce you in English, Dennis. Our guest today is his name is Dennis Speed, who is a, who is a writer at Executive Intelligence Review and staff writer of La Rouge. I'm going to give my word to you, uh, uh, Dennis, so you can start with the breaking news. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me on the show, uh, and I'm pleased to be on. And if people in places like Yerevan and other places hear from me, I'd be I'm, uh, happy to. Uh, address you the breaking news which just happened about eight hours ago is that the deputy director of the federal bureau of investigation andrew mccabe has announced his plan to retire uh, early next year in january february of next year now the reason is the criticism that he has been getting uh, for his role uh, in the attempts to railroad the president of the United States, Donald Trump. And uh, as a result of this, what's happened is that he is coming under investigation just as the general counsel of the FBI, uh, James Baker, came under investigation. Uh, now, the importance of this, and the story was broken uh, by the Washington Post, I should point out. And here's a short uh, uh, paragraph that will tell everybody what happened. It says that he faced... Mr. McCabe faced renewed criticism from Republican critics in recent weeks following accusations of bias in the FBI and the belief that the Federal Bureau of Investigation let Secretary of State Hillary Clinton off easily during its investigation into her private email server. Now, I want to say something about what this means, what's going on. I think people are aware that there's been this claim that the nation of Russia hacked the American uh, election in the case of the Democratic Party in the summer of 2016, uh, and that the President Trump is in some way controlled by or manipulated by or uh, 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 by the Russians, by the Russian government and by Vladimir Putin in particular. Executive Intelligence Review, which as you reference is a publication created by Lenin LaRouche, has contended the entire time there is no truth to this. It is absolute fabrication. It is bunk. Uh, there was no hack by Russia of the elections. It was a leak. But there is a foreign power that's very involved in manipulating the United States elections, and that is the nation of Great Britain. Uh, specifically, we are charging that it was Christopher Steele, who is uh, called a former... MI6 agent, that is to say, a British intelligence agent. Uh, he admits to being a British intelligence agent for 20 years. He wrote the dossier, which has been used against the president. And that dossier, we believe, was actually used for the purpose of securing the original attempts to surveil the president and surveil his associates. That hasn't come out yet, but that's where we're going. And it's become pretty hot for people uh, that were involved. Now, the particular reason that Mr. McKay, the deputy director, uh, uh, is, is now resigning is that for the last two days, in other words, all day Friday, all day Thursday, he testified in front of the House of Representatives uh, to their intelligence committee. Uh, and uh, and uh, basically, he contradicted all the other people that had come before. So he basically made a fool of himself. I mean, several times it was just uh, almost laughable. There was one very particular occasion 
where they asked him some questions that they knew he knew the answers to, and he claimed he didn't. Um, uh, for example, uh, when he was asked the question, uh, when he learned that the dossier had been financed by Hillary Clinton and by the DNC, he said he couldn't remember, except that the committee had documents which were given to it with his signature on them, establishing exactly when he knew that the DNC was financing. So he was, he was either so rattled or so incompetent that he was claiming not to know things he clearly knew. And so after two days of that, here's what happened. When he showed up, he came with a man, a general counsel of the FBI named uh, James Baker. So Mr. Baker uh, was with uh, Mr. McCabe on Tuesday when he first showed up. But then by Thursday, Friday, James Baker was gone. He was, no, he was dismissed as the counsel. Now Mr. McCabe has said he's going to resign. So here's what I want people to understand so that we don't get lost in the details. Mm. The investigators are now being investigated. And it's only a matter of time before we get to uh, the special counsel, Robert Mueller. Um, and we are stating that Robert Mueller is uh, uh, incompetent, that he is biased, that he has been involved in a vendetta against President Trump since before the election going back to the period of June, at least, of 2016. And that after the election, they have tried, since the time of November, to um, make a case against the president that does not exist. And so we consider this to be a coup, and we are happy to have played a role in exposing these facts. So basically, um, a coup, coup attempt, let's put it that way, uh, let's put the, the term. Yes, that's we, we, correct. And they've, they've been using the fake news, CNN, and different news agencies that have been proven to be uh, uh, fake news, total fake news. And we also see all the social media uh, attacks on President Trump um, of him being illegitimate. And I mean, we hear all kinds of stories. Uh, yes. The president, when he says something, they convert it into something else. And uh, let's, I, I, this, this breaking news, what will be the outcome in your idea, in your own assessment? Do you think they are going to finally convict those criminals that have been trying to destroy America and acting as if the intelligent agencies themselves? Well, here's, what is, here's what's happening. Some of the Democratic Party congressmen have been getting up in the Congress and saying, President Trump had better not fire Robert Mueller. Right. Don't fire him as special counsel. The president has never said that he was going to fire Robert Mueller, and the president doesn't have to fire Robert Mueller. All that has to be done is to go to everybody that Robert Mueller is working with, and you will find that all of these people have been involved in a conspiracy earlier against the president. Now, this has come out in different ways at different times. I'm not going to try to give all the names and particulars, although we, I could do much. I'll just give you uh, just one other example. You know, there's this guy who was the named Peter Strzok. Mm -hmm. And Peter Strzok was the number two counterintelligence officer of the FBI. Now, he has a uh, he's been carrying on an extramarital affair with a lady by the name of, of Lisa Page. Um, Page was a CIA agent formerly, and uh, oh, excuse me, I'm, I'm sorry, she works at the Department of Justice. She's not CIA, Department of Justice. And uh, they were, wrote thousands of emails during the period of the election denouncing the president before he was elected. Right. And at one point, Peter Strzok talks in the emails about the need to have an insurance policy in the unlikely event that Donald Trump is elected. Now, he doesn't say what the insurance policy is, but the reason he's important is that in June of, la of 2016, he was one of the people that was involved in the um, uh, uh, questioning of Hillary Clinton. And that was all about the question of her use of her server and her Internet and her emails. 
there was a thought that during that investigation, Hillary Clinton might be charged with something, might be indicted. Well, the, are, there are two different wordings uh, that uh, could have been used by uh, Comey when he evaluated the case and when he gave a press conference. And one was grossly negligent. That was one wording. Mm -hmm. There was another wording, which is extremely reckless. The second wording, extremely work reckless, carries no indictment uh, possibility. So the person that changed the wording from grossly negligent to extremely reckless was Peter Strzok. So this is a guy that had expressed, I mean, what he had literally written, for example, to his girlfriend was, Hillary Clinton should win 100 million to zero. That, that, those were the kinds of statements he was making. Now, these are supposed to be impartial uh, law enforcement officials. Everybody expects when you talk about the FBI or whatever, it's the Federal Bureau of Investigation, not the Federal Bureau of Advocacy. So you're not supposed to be advocating for some candidate that you like or you dislike. The same thing if you're working for the CIA or the other agencies. You're supposed to be working impartially. Yes, you may have a view. But the idea that you let your view impact what you do, that is criminal. That's criminal behavior on behalf of law enforcement or intelligence officers. So you ask me a question I'm not, not going to answer. I think that, as Judge Judge Janine Pirro has been saying uh, recently, that these people should be taken away in handcuffs. Um, to make that happen, I think all that's needed is that the American people should... Uh, so should circulate material such as we've recently uh, printed. We have a special investigative report on Robert Mueller. Uh, it was called, Robert Mueller is an amoral legal assassin. He will do his job if you let him. Uh -huh. And we've been circulating this for months now. Uh, and we believe that if the American people know the, know the truth, that these people will, in fact, go to jail. So, um, I, I, as, what, as, as what I understand, Democrats have been uh, f full supporters of destroying America. I'm going to say it that way because they're the ones who are supporting these false fabrications against the president. False assumptions, false news, fake news, and they're attacking him nonstop. Um, I would like to know what other powers are behind this because... Um, in, in, in a way, I want to explain, I know you also write for Schuller Institute. You, can, you, you yes. are one of the members of Schuller. As I read in Schuller Institute, I, ca I can see how the American uh, left created the educational system to dumb down society. And all those aspects of how they try to manipulate people into their lives, how they try to manipulate p people to depend on the government instead of live a free life. So can we elaborate? What are those forces that are behind this? Okay, well, let me, let me do three different things. The first is to address what you said about the Democratic Party. Let's remember that the Democratic Party had a candidate named Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. who was legitimately running. And remember, he was an independent, actually. He's an independent in the Congress. He decided to run as a Democrat. Let's remember that what actually happened, according to the emails that came out, which were leaked, not hacked, mm -hmm. is that Bernie Sanders was robbed, that Hillary Clinton used the Department of the, the uh, Democratic National Committee to manipulate the election and the outcome of the election against Bernie Sanders, and that the entire discussion uh, uh, around the issue of June of, 19, of 2016 was that Hillary Clinton and her people had stolen the election. You may remember there was even a certain amount of a furor right, at the, right. that time. Now, here's why I'm telling you this story. Clearly, the Democratic National Committee and Hillary Clinton, we know this from Donna Brazile, who then became briefly the head of the DNC. She states that they had been paying all of the bills of the DNC, that the Clinton campaign directly was running the DNC from much earlier than before the convention. Mm -hmm. they, they, so, so that meant <laughs> that, the, that the campaign that was running against Bernie Sanders was controlling the so-called impartial DNC. This is one of the most corrupt 
cases in the history of all of American politics. So, so first, I want to just point out that it's not everybody in the Democratic Party, but that at the top of the Democratic Party, they carried out a completely corrupt process that prevented Bernie Sanders from getting the nomination. Now, you asked about forces behind this, and that's very important. So let's go to Move On, the famous Move On, which was has been controlled by George Soros. Mm-hmm. And this is where you get to the issue. Exactly. Because what has been the case is that since the period of about 2005, 2006, George Soros has directly been the money bags behind not merely Move On, but also Black Lives Matter and several other so-called grassroots movements. And so when you look at what's called identity politics in America, whether you're talking about feminism or you're talking about the black movement or whatever you're talking about, these smaller or, or weird kind of movements are basically financed by George Soros. And so that force, let's remember his role. His role was that he was the person, George Soros was the person that really brought Barack Obama's fundraising mm-hmm. online back in the period of 2007. Uh, Barack Obama got, had a meeting with Soros in the fall of 2007, and he had been be, uh, supporting him uh, much earlier, that Soros had, had given him money for his, uh, his, his Senate campaign, even his state Senate campaign, the first campaign, gave him $60,000 for that campaign. And after the meeting that he had in 2007, they had a meeting. It was in it was in Midtown Manhattan, uh, at uh, and and Soros had a meeting uh, with Obama. And then right after that meeting, uh, there was a meeting. They walked into another room, and there were a group of high-powered financial persons in the me- in the meeting. Mm-hmm. One of them was a man by the name of Wolf. That's his last name. I believe it's Robert Wolf. I'm not quite sure of the first right. name. Right. Who was the American representative? of Union Bank of Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Uh, He now runs one of the largest private drone companies. They create drones for military and other use uh, in the world. Anyway, he organized the finances of the Barack Obama campaign. And so the point I'm making here is that Soros effectively, it's not that he owned the Barack Obama campaign, but he was the catalyst for the process. And when we look today at, for example, Black Lives Matter, he gave them over $30 million. So we're, we're, this is what we're dealing with. So the, the, the issue of the Democratic Party is it's lost its soul. It used to stand for working people. It used to stand for high wages. It used to stand for uh, civil rights, for that matter. But if you are uh, destroying the campaign of someone that legitimately is running in your party by manipulating it with money, and if your candidate, in this case Hillary Clinton, is openly saying, when she goes and gives a speech on Wall Street, I give one message for you, I give another message to the people, then obviously that is not real representation. Right. I would just say one last thing this is the third thing. The Democratic Party could choose to work with the president. I think he will uh, attempt uh, in the next month, probably in the State of the Union address, uh, or maybe before. He will, he will give them an olive branch, and he will say, look, we need to rebuild our country. Our roads, bridges, highways, tunnels, dams, our, our power systems, our water system, um, hospitals, education, all of these things need to be rebuilt. Will you help me do that? And if they take that, well, it will divide the Democratic Party, but that would be the best way out for them at this point. Well, that was the main promise of Trump when he, before he was elected. That was, that's the reason why American people voted for him. Even though the polls were talking something else, we believe polls were fake news too. However, the American people believed in him and voted for him because that was the main promise. Uh, he said America comes first, meaning uh, he will fix the infrastructure, he will fix the dead educational system, he will fix the prison systems, which uh, people get arrested for no reason sometimes. He, will, he, he was trying to rehabilitate the system, and his message on the inauguration day was one of the best messages I've heard, uh, that to rebuild America and to put American people first and their lives first, which was basically for, for, forsaken for 30, 40 years by presidents 
who were elected to kill people in other countries and forget their people here. Let's put it that way, in in more uh, genuine way, because other presidents were serving for the interest of the internationalists, the banksters, and they survive on killing people because that's where the money is selling guns, is selling, selling drugs, and etc. Uh, so when the president starts speaking about uh, about rebuilding America, obviously there were enemies within, and one of them, I believe, is the British Empire uh, we, through the MI6. They're trying to destroy. Uh, uh, America and make it look bad and basically destroy within the uh, structure. What other powers are there in your own uh, understanding? Can we, uh, can we can you elaborate on that? Because sure, let's, if, let's unpack that. There's several things here. There's right, several things right. here that you brought up. You, I thank you for doing that. Uh, let's take the question of the international banking uh, cabal, the conspiracy. You know, there was a film done some time back called The International Yes, I, I watched that, yes. Yeah, yeah, in which there's a discussion with an Italian presidential candidate, uh, and he will, uh, in a few moments in the, in the film, he later gets assassinated, and he's talking to a couple of these agents who are trying to figure out a particular crime. And he, they're asking, he's telling them the motive. And he's saying, we have to understand, the motive is not money the way you think of it, and the motive is not arms sales he says the motive is the debt and i say we mean the debt he explains well if you sell guns to two sides in a war mm -hmm. then the side that loses needs you because they've lost now they're bankrupt and the side that wins needs you because they need more weapons so as long as you provide the loans for them you win either way you always control, you always manage, you always manipulate. So it was right. a question of debt. So it's that this was the key thing, to put people in debt and to control the system in this way. Now, what we've seen and what the president understands, remember that Donald Trump is not afraid of bankruptcy. Right. He understands the actual way bankruptcy works. If you have a business that's not working, you call a halt to it. You walk away from that, and you create new credit, and you start the business again. This is what we need to do with the United States. And his discussions with China in particular are of this variety. I think what's important is that the president said during the election, you already said this before, he said he was for the idea of Glass-Steagall, that is to say you return to the old system we had for 60 years, which was that we would separate commercial banks from investment banks, so you separate speculators from Main Street, you know, where people are taking their paycheck, mm -hmm. they, they're working hard. It's not so that you don't allow speculators to use their money to speculate, you know, the regular people, normal people. But besides that, you also said something about his inaugural speech. His inaugural speech had a very specific orientation at the very end, in which he said, we're nine years away from the 250th anniversary of the birth of the United States. What kind of country do you want to see in nine years? It was his basic message, okay? We're gonna be looking at that and celebrating that. Where do we want this country to be? And I think that's a very important thing. This past Monday, he uh, spoke about the idea of the United States returning a uh, man to the moon. Mm -hmm. And he said, we don't wanna just go back just as a kind of a gesture. We want this to be an ongoing enterprise, which means industrialization of the moon and so on. That's very interesting because the Chinese want to do the same thing. The Russians, of course, have a fairly advanced space program. So you could once again do something which is cooperative, which would also alleviate ten war tensions and military tensions. So he said that on Monday. So if you look at it, the truth of the matter is that if it were the case that you were just trying to make America great again, as he said, we have all the basis to do that. But there's a force or forces. Now, the British Empire, let's come to that. The city of London is uh, uh, a particular financial district within London. There's literally an area called the city of London. It has its own mayor, its own city council, et cetera. It's, it's the Wall Street of, of London. That and our Wall Street here control a system that no longer works for the people. Exactly. It works based on debt. 
So the bailouts we had back in 2008, the banks are sitting on all that money. They never loan it out. They're using it to prop up their bad debt. The president knows the thing you do with bad debt is you simply cancel it. It doesn't affect the people. For example, Puerto Rico, that's a case of um, point. 80 billion, you have to cancel the $80 billion. You just sit, start to build. The president has the power to do it in this way. Here's what he can do. He goes to the Treasury of the United States. He says, we have an emergency circumstance. We are going to go to the U.S. Treasury, not necessarily the Federal Reserve, although you can also use the Federal Reserve in a different way. But you issue the credit. And what are you doing? You're going to issue it and you're going to earmark it. It's not just general money for anybody. It's for manufacturers. It's for machine tools. It's for starting construction. And what you do is you only allow that money, that, that credit, to be disbursed to businesses and corporations that have passed requirements that the federal government has announced. And they pass these requirements, and these companies are able to draw upon these funds just for the purpose of jumpstarting the project. The reason it's not a state-controlled project is because private businesses now get incorporated. They get the ability to actually pay people so that now they can kickstart, so to speak, production. You do that all over the United States, and you do it for the reasons we know. Everybody knows the conditions of the roads. Everybody knows the conditions of the railroads. The president knows he can do this and that bankruptcy is merely a temporary circumstance which you then use for the purpose of restarting real physical jobs. That's what we're missing in America. We used to build a lot of things. We used to make everything for ourselves. We had our own uh, energy sources. We had our own far food source. That's what we had to, used to have. That's what we need to do. And if we were doing that, China would assist us. Uh, that's because they, they have reasons. They have $1 trillion of our debt. So that's one of the reasons that China is going to assist us. Mm -hmm. Russia doesn't want to tangle with the United States. They've got their own problems. They would love to work with the United States. I mean, they got 11 time zones. they got a massive na country that has all kinds of resources, and they have very advanced scientific resources. So in summary, number one, the bankers are the problem. What we're talking about, yes, the Rothschilds, but we're also talking about the general system, the transatlantic system. That thing has to be changed. It's got to operate for the people again, and the president will do it. And I think that if you look at what he said about nine years from now, that shows he has a vision for the future. He's trying to do what JFK did, get the people to think in terms of the future of the country and the country's relationship to the rest of the world. And I think that is an excellent policy. So to, to sum that part, I can say the forces that are trying to destroy uh, the character of Trump and trying to manipulate all these lies are the same forces that have established a system of debt and enslaved society, enslaved people, and as we see, no solution for anything as of yet. Uh, and and when, the, when, when one man stands up and speaks the truth, just like they assassinated Martin Luther King, just like they assassinated JFK, uh, so those that work against that uh, secret cabal of Rothschild family, unfortunately, all of a sudden, they are either assassinated or they're either uh, talked against, uh, and, and we see the fake news. So uh, there is evidence of the intelligence agency, not everybody, uh, not everybody, of course, but the top of the, uh, top of the uh, cabal, which are in mm -hmm. control of it, uh, now we see one of them resigning because of his lies. How, how long can this survive? Are we, uh, is there a plan to stop all these mass uh, uh, character assassinations? Are we, um, is there enough evidence to lock these people, just like the judge said? Well, the answer to that question is yes. That's the short answer. I think the thing that, that people would wish to know, this condition won't continue indefinitely in fact i don't think it continue can continue for more than a few more months at most mm -hmm. one side or the other will win and the president's situation is he has to fight these people you may remember that the second day he came into office he stated that he intended to clean up uh the 17 intelligence agencies mm -hmm. 
and people may not have understood what that meant, but you're now beginning to see what that meant. Uh, he was aware, uh, you mentioned, uh, for example, the assassination of Martin Luther King. We're going to be uh, uh, in the 50th anniversary of that this year, April 4th, uh, uh, was that assassination. And if I'm not mistaken, I think June 6th uh, will be the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Robert Kennedy. So if those two assassinations happened within two months of each other uh, uh, back in 1968. And you may remember that the president also has released portions of the Kennedy files, not all of the files, because there was something that happened at the last minute where some people were trying to say, well, no, we still can't release them because of national security. And of course, we're all wondering, wait a minute, it's 54 years later. What is it that's in those files now that would be a problem? So, so to, to, to go at what you're, what you're asking, I'd like to just uh, indicate something which might uh, uh, surprise people because we're talking about this international process. You know, there's a group called the Club of Rome. Some people have heard of them. Right. Okay, and of course, this is a big sort of population and environmental group. Uh, they wrote a book called The First Global Revolution. This is back in 1991. I think it's important for everybody to remember and older people remember, of course, people in Armenia will remember, that the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. Mm -hmm. So between the fall of the Berlin Wall on November 9th, 1989, uh, and the collapse of the Soviet Union during the summer of 1991, people began to realize the world was going to shift. The people at the Club of Rome wrote this. I'm going to just quote this one paragraph because it will go right to what you're saying. They said this, in searching for a new enemy to unite us, they needed a new enemy because the you know, Soviet Union was now going to go away. Mm -hmm. In searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine, and other things would fit the bill. But in designating them as the enemy, we fall into the trap of mistaking symptoms for causes. All these dangers are caused by human intervention, and is, it is only through changed attitudes and behavior that they can be overcome. The real enemy, then, is humanity itself. I'm just going to repeat that last sentence. The real enemy, then, is humanity itself. Now, here's what I want everybody to understand. There are forces out there, and in the case of the United States, ever since 1974, uh, forces uh, uh, that, that were associated with a report which was called the National Security Study Memor Memorandum Number 200. National Security Study Memorandum 200. came out in 1974. Uh, George Bush was actually head of the CIA. He had to sign off on the report. Henry Kissinger was involved in the creation of the report. Several other people were involved. And what the report talked about was the national security implications of population growth in various nations. So the, the contention was that if population grew in certain countries, and they named Bangladesh, they named Mexico, they named Nigeria, and 12 other, other countries, that this would threaten the national security interests of the United States and that these resources had to be uh, essentially preserved for the United States. Now, first of all, that's not true. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many different ways in which one can expand natural resources. But what's important about what I'm saying about it to, to people is that there was a view back in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s that population growth was the major concern and that you had to limit it, uh, and, and there were people that were signed on to that view. That is false. And if you look at, for example, China, you see that. 1.4 billion people, and 700 million of them come out of poverty over the last 20 years, mm -hmm. so that the more people these people have had, the higher their, 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 their living standard has become. Uh, that's not unusual. The same thing has happened in the case of the history of the United States. When the United States had three and a half million people, 90% of the people were working on farms. We have 3% of the people or less working on farms now, and you got 330 million. And we export food, even though we, it should be better food and all that. 
So I'm saying this so that people understand the motive. And the motive in terms of the British imperial motive, it's called Malthusianism, named after Parson Thomas Malthus. It's the notion that people are the problem, humanity is the problem, humanity causes all the problems for the rest of the biosphere or something, and you know we breathe and it's carbon dioxide and it's polluting and basically we got to cut the carbon dioxide and of course the best way to do that is don't breathe i mean it comes down to that so we have these people with these crazy views and they use that and they manipulate debt and they manipulate the finances of countries and there are people who have broken from that such as president trump there have been other people that have broken through it. John Kennedy didn't believe that. Uh, King Martin Luther King didn't believe that. And so those people become the targets of this cabal. And uh, they've been trying to create a new enemy ever since the fall of the Berlin Wall and then the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so that's where we got the famous thing with uh, terrorism. And that's a whole other story. That's an important story. Uh, but the idea that the United States military, which spends more money on its military than the next 26 nations combined, is, is somehow threatened by other nations, is absurd. And as you mentioned, that idea that you have presidents that come into power whose job basically is to kill people, or at least to stand, not stand in the way of other people killing people, uh, that ended uh, on January 20th. 2017 of this year this president is not committed to that he doesn't see that that's in american interest and uh that has really upset a lot of people and he's insisted that he's going to take his path he has to be supported in that regardless of what you happen to think of him as an individual there are many people uh you know that have a lot of problems with donald trump what he may say you have a problem with anybody right. that has that kind of position so i just Sorry to take that long, but I wanted to just give people that point of view. I actually haven't seen this kind of uh, misinformation on the media about any president that existed in the United States. I don't know, maybe, I don't know way back history, but current history I'm talking about from 1976 that I've been here. I have not, never seen this kind of misinformation on a president. So it, it basically gives me, the, I, gives me the confidence that he's under the attack because he's fighting those evil forces that are tr trying to destroy our families. For example, you talked about Soros. Soros is here to basically uh, depopulate, uh, uh, depopulate and c create a chaos, a uh, depopulation uh, agenda they have. And it's part of them, the global elite. They don't want to see successful uh, futures. They don't want to see, they, they want to destroy the family. So what do they do? They take in f uh, feminist ideology and educate people in public schools, you know, uh, liberalism. All those are aspects that Trump wants to fight against. And the, the dark power, I can call it Satanism, doesn't want to allow him. And I, I believe, uh, uh, you know, for example, let's take, for example, the prison systems. Uh, mm -hmm. Prison systems, we have Higher, prison, uh, higher prisoners in the whole world than any, any, any part of the country. Even under dictators, they don't have this kind of prison, uh, prisons or number of prisoners that they exist. So um, take that in consideration. They're destroying families. They're destroying the head of the family, the man. They're, incarcerate, they're incarcerating. There is no, uh, they don't have the answer for uh, drug addiction. They give them... Uh, certain uh, fake uh, treatment that doesn't have a, a solution, basically. So we're, we're talking about all these things. How do we stop the, this? And how? What would the people have to do to stand by the president to fight those evil powers? This is our last stance. Let's put it this way. That's what I believe. Okay. Well, I, I, I think you you brought up several things, and again, let's unpack this and take it in sections because it has several uh, interesting elements. Uh, and as I say this, let me say to everybody that Executive Intelligence Review and Lyndon LaRouche as an individual, I mean, he's a statesman, he's an economist. Um, I met him back in 1970, and then I worked with him from 1972. It's been 45 years. And Mr. LaRouche is still very active uh, intellectually. He's in Germany now and working there. Uh, but I, I want to say something to you about what I learned from him. Uh, he was a World War II veteran, and, and he always made the point that the United States 
under Franklin Roosevelt mm -hmm. was a different country than afterwards. And he, and he made that point to many of us who were much younger because we had never seen that president. For us, the, the closest thing was JFK, but JFK was assassinated in his first term. So uh, while a few things were done, uh, we never we didn't have a, a president like Roosevelt, which was 12 years, mm -hmm. 1932, 1933 to 1945. I mean, that was a long time uh, and, and to see the country really evolve. So so in taking what you're you're talking about, you mentioned uh, the time of 1976, I guess, when you have been uh, came here. And that's the time of the Carter administration. Exactly. That's yeah. good. That's a good time to take. Because the Carter administration was synthetic. It was created by Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was the executive director of what was called the Trilateral Commission. This was created in 1973, and it was something that was financed by the Rockefeller family. Uh, and the first Carter administration contained several members of the Trilateral Commission, including Mr. Brzezinski, who was mm. the national security advisor. Now, that may seem to be ancient history, until you look at the year 2007 and realize that the first establishment figure, main establishment figure, to endorse Barack Obama was the big New Brzezinski. Mm -hmm. And now you begin to see the long arc of history and how it worked. Why was the Trilateral Commission important? What they did with the Carter administration was that all this stuff that you're talking about was mainstreamed in America. Drug legalization, for example, the decriminalization of marijuana, that was something that the Carter administration pushed big time. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of the so-called, you know, different sexes and this other stuff, and this all came in with the Carter administration. Uh, the notion of neoliberalism, if you want to put it that way, in terms of an ideology, environmentalism, this all came in in that period, but something else came in. Zbigniew Brzezinski was the person that began the war in Afghanistan, and he was the one that created the jihadists. Mm -hmm. He did it in Afghanistan, and he did it in a famous speech that he gave on the border of Afghanistan between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Brzezinski did this in the summer of 1979, and he actually gave a, an interview uh, to a publication, a French publication, I think La Nouvelle Observateur, I think it was 2005, where he talked about this. And his idea was to induce the Soviet Union to attack Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan, rather, by uh, creating the idea of a jihad. Right. And the notion was, right, that the notion was called the uh, Islamic fundamentalist card. Now, actually, Brzezinski didn't create that idea. That was created by a British intelligence agent who's still alive right now. His name is Bernard Lewis. He's probably oh. 100 years old now, maybe 101. Very evil He's person. Down at yeah. Very evil Princeton person. University. Right. Okay? And he created what was called the Ark of Crisis. Right. And this was every Islamic nation or person, a nation that had large Islamic populations. So I'm saying all this because later on, Brzezinski would write a book called The Grand Chessboard, which was in the 90s. What he was referring to is what the British called the Great Game. It was about Afghanistan and Pakistan and that area and trying to foment uh, dissent right, in Chechnya and these other places. So Vladimir Putin, when he came in in 99, was confronted with the results of this long arc of Brzezinski's 20-year war, which had successfully, from Brzezinski's standpoint, destabilized the Soviet Union. But then they left all these people. Uh, who didn't know how to do anything itself except uh, anything else except fight, including Osama bin Laden. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's very close to the to the Bush family, for example, and others. Remember that bin Laden construction, the father, ran all the construction projects in Saudi Arabia. Right. So I'm saying all that to say, people say, well, that's the ancient history. But then when you realize Brzezinski's role with Barack Obama, and you to go back to Barack Obama's apparent mission in Pakistan when he was a student back at Columbia University and you recognize that Brzezinski was teaching at Columbia University at that time. We don't know that Obama was in his classes. We don't know what the, what the connection was, but we do know 
that the uh, first establishment figure to endorse Obama was in the early part of 2007, which Brzezinski, you see the way that this process works. Right. So when you ask me the question, what do we do? Can we, can we stop it? Yes. But well, people have to know some history, and they have to know the history so they know what they're actually fighting now. Exactly. So British intelligence has this whole thing. They are the architects of the great game. They are the people that have been fighting with the Chechen. Chechen thing goes back to the British in the 1830s. Right? Uh, I mean, there's a, with, with a whole heck right. of a tier and people like that. So I, I, I think today, remember one thing about America. America fought a war against the British. That's how it got free. That was the great American Revolution. Mm-hmm. And since that time, the British have been trying to recapture the United States. Um, they financed the Civil War, for example, the 1860s. And they, after the Second World War, when Roosevelt died, uh, Winston Churchill was all over Harry Truman. It was Winston Churchill that, that started the Cold War in right. Fort Missouri in 1946. Not Truman. He didn't give the speech. Winston Churchill gave the speech. So... As we and, and notice that Donald Trump has said he's going to go, he thinks, to England, in, uh, to Great Britain in February because there's a new British uh, American embassy that's been right. built there. Mm-hmm. But he said, I'm not going to meet with the Queen. This is just a few, you know, right. in the last two weeks. So he has a different impulse and he has the right impulse. He has, if, if, if not an instinctive, uh, he has an informed view of uh, this problem. And so that's what the establishment that I've referred to fears. They realize that Trump is not playing the game they want him to play. Exactly. All the presidents have had to follow, and this president basically doesn't want to follow the New World Order, global elite, whatever you want to call the agenda, and he wants to fight it. He wants to stop it. I'm going to take one phone call because there are a lot of people calling. I want to hear in, sure. uh, less, less one of the questions. Yes, you're on the air. Good I, evening, guys. I just wanted to tell you guys uh, that uh, I just want to wish every viewer uh, that uh, Merry Christmas for everyone. Thank you. For now and uh, for, for the future who's going to uh, watch on YouTube. Not the happy holiday. It's a Thank you. Stay, uh, Christmas. Thank you. But another thing I'm still learning, you know, that uh, politicians are like uh, philosophies. They say the, the pornogra- pornography is the same thing as the politicians. <laughs> but another thing I just want to say that what that is not against uh, <clears throat> Democrats or uh, the Republicans or Russia or North Korea or Armenia or okay. uh, no one else. This is about one world government, our exactly. principality is against, like Lord Jesus Christ said, is against the darkness of the power, who, against the humanity, who want to destroy all world. Okay, let's, the, let's give chance for other callers. Thank you very much. Let's give chance to other all callers. Right. Thank you very much. All Thank right. you. Uh, Ayo Ramazek, you're in the air? You're on the air? Thank you very much. Ayo? You're on the air. Hi, hi, Bedros. Uh, I have to thank you about this opportunity. It's brilliant uh, show. Thank you very much. Uh, can you listen? Yes, yes, I can. Yes. Yes, uh, it's very, very brilliant speaker, and I would like to know his titles and what's his uh, opinion about uh, Trump's Jerusalem issue. Thank you. And uh, I appreciate him so fluently, so right on the point, so calmly, uh, with all details. He, he is very knowledgeable. Thanks, both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will, we will put this on, uh, later on. on uh, actually, they, we have a live Facebook, and I'm going to add it to YouTube, too, so a lot of people more can hear it. And, uh, sure. uh, Let's take one more phone call because I, I want to hear sure. everybody. Ayo Ramatek, you're on the air. You're on the air. Yes. Hi, I'm, I'm watching your uh, show, Petros Adjan. You are very good with that. 
And I want to ask the guest uh, if say president is uh, a peaceful, doesn't want a war, but how come he bombed Syria 59 missiles and uh, peaceful people died over there, okay. destroyed the airport, helped ISIS, and now he's very, very for uh, Jerusalem. I don't know why. No okay. President. We can make that. We can. Twenty-eight, hundred twenty-eight countries voted for no. Thank you. We can. But we he can. He is very, very supportive of uh, Israel and Jerusalem, and he doesn't think about America. He, does, he thinks only for certain people. Like. Thank you very much. But we will we will uh, dedicate a program for that some other time, because we are mm. talking about inner politics right now. Uh, I mm. myself am not for the for that decision. However, we're not going to get into that detail because that's going to take three, four hours. I, mm -hmm. I, ta I take that term in a prophetic manner. Uh, it's against the principles of the prophecy, basically. So um, we're not going to mm -hmm. discuss that, though. So um, the, one of the questions was, uh, um, what's your opinion? I'm, I don't want to go into that either. So we're going to take one more phone call. Ayo mm -hmm. Haram you're on the you're in the air? You're on air? Hello? Ayo? Yes, you can talk. Am I on the air? Yes, you are. Yeah, I just want to, you know, like, it happened that I was watching your TV, and then I just want to salute and respect you because of supporting President Trump. And I've never seen any Armenian program just bluffly supporting President Trump's policy. I really, really appreciate, and I just want to say, like, Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, we, I've, I've supported uh, President Trump's election uh, from day one mm -hmm. because I saw, because his promise was to build the infrastructure of the United States that is broken. But since we have uh, one, one minute exactly, I want you, I'm going to give you the podium for one minute and then we have to shut the program down. Okay, no problem. So let me just say, as the, someone referred to it, we, we fight not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. The forces of darkness and wickedness in high places. That's what we know. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time, there's another way for us to think because we can be agents of something great. Uh, we have a president who's prepared to respond to greatness. So if the people show greatness, he will. Mm -hmm. And so I'm reminded of one uh, quote from William Shakespeare, and I think we'll, we'll leave it at that. And it's from the end of the play, Julius Caesar. He says... There is a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the values of their lives are bound up in shallows and miseries. On such a full sea are we now afloat. We must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. I'll just say one thing about that. He's just saying we have an opportunity right now, just like when the tide comes in. Now, when you, if you got you to take it, and if you don't take it, then you lose everything. That's what we've got to do. We've got to show fortitude and courage. And if we do, I'm sure we can win. Thank you, Mr. Speed, for being on our program. I'm sure we are going to talk uh, some other times more in details of other issues uh, concerning to United, uh, make America great again. Thank you once again for taking your time from this precious holiday time. And we will be back uh, soon with you again. And I'm going to close the program with Armenian. Shinor Agaleng or Mezet Mez Miatsak. Uremen Dennis Speed, Executive Intelligence Review. You have Laurish Staff Writer. Shade Dakar Kir, Anstavoru Chumbunebor, Miatsan Nahang Neru Mech. You have Gash Hadi, Miatsan Nahang Neru, Darper or Gaz Magerbu Chumneru Ed. Այս շապով բիտի վերջասնենք այսօրվա պրոգրամը, ծեզ պոլորի մերի Քրիսմս, միչև կարշապատ ասված սեր պոլորի հետ։ Ոկեի, այս 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 այ